Bienvenue à Paris. Welcome to Paris. Welcome to another video. Aaron and I are blessed to be here for 10 days. Just really gonna hang out in the city, wanna pretend like we're locals and pretend like we're Parisians and uh, just see how it goes. We're gonna see some tennis, tried to get tickets to the football, the Champions League final. Didn't quite work out. We'll cheer on Liverpool from uh, the streets of Paris. I think that'll do. And uh, just looking forward to these 10 days. How about you? Yeah, I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. We're gonna do a painting class in the Luxembourg Gardens. Jardins du Luxembourg. Oui. 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 I'm going to try to speak un petit French, even though my accent is terrible and I forget every single word every single time I try to say it. Boulangerie. Patisserie. Boulangerie. Patisserie. Yeah, excited to jump into it. Kicking it off in the Tuileries Gardens as mentioned, this is quite possibly my favorite part of Paris. The city is dotted with gardens and public green spaces, but none grander than the Tuileries. Running in a straight line east to west for about one mile from the glass pyramid of the Louvre Museum to the Place de la Concorde, this walk offers views of multiple world-renowned museums, beautifully manicured hedgerows, sculptures like this one of Julius Caesar that could just as easily be in one of the museums, and the Eiffel Tower itself off in the distance. There's also something pleasing about the gravel you walk upon as you enjoy all of these sights. There are multiple fountains and little ponds to kick back and relax next to as ducks and other birds lazily enjoy their summer in the city as well. Plan a picnic for this spot or just turn it into your own little maze for a pit. Either way, it's a great place to stop and enjoy your surroundings. Now, I don't consider myself the biggest foodie in the world, but it's still an important part of any Paris itinerary regardless. The food and dining culture here is so prominent and it's fun to sit down at a cafe and slowly make your way through your meal and people watch all the while as most establishments have all chairs positioned towards the street rather than face to face at each table. In addition to our own efforts, we booked a food, wine and pastry tour in the Marais, which I'll share a link to below. The container, how long would it been ferment, all of this together will give the tradition, basically. And that plus the rest gives you a specific tour. So that's why, for example, Bordeaux is not a tour. We were treated to a wide variety of French cheeses, breads, and wines, accompanied by the backstories for each one. The pastry portion was unquestionably my favorite, and it was also really cool to hear about the newer imports to French cuisine via immigration that has taken place over the centuries. All the chocolate. Another beautiful day to wake up in our tiny Parisian apartment. Look at the rooftops behind in the Pont Pompidou museum in the distance there but uh today's a special day because we are finishing up our breakfast and heading out to Roland Gallops where they play the French Open each year on the beautiful clay courts here in Paris. Aaron you almost ready? Roland Garros is a proud French tradition as the best tennis players in the world gather each year at the end of May to battle it out on the clay. We got to the grounds an hour before play started to ensure we had excellent seats for Canadian Denis Shapovalov against young Danish upstart Holger Rune. Many European sporting events, including the French Open, allow you to bring your own food into the venue, so feel free to pack a bag on the day to save yourself some euros. 
Roland Garros has updated the facility quite dramatically since we were last here in 2017, and all 19 courts offer great vantage points to see all the stars of today's game. Moving around the grounds between courts is quick and easy despite it being the smallest venue of the four tennis grand slams after Wimbledon, the US Open, and the Australian Open, and there are multiple watch zones to catch multiple courts at once as well as plenty of shopping on site even places to buy macaroons if you didn't pack any. Aaron and I were fortunate as on the day we went, the weather cooperated and French great Joe Wilfried Sanga played his last career match against this year's eventual finalist, the Norwegian Kasper Ruud. The atmosphere was pretty cool to experience and the French Tennis Federation put together a nice send-off for Sanga after the match as the roof was closing due to rain. The next day we decided to explore the Saint-Ouen flea market. This market found on the northern edge of Paris is widely considered the largest antiques and second-hand market in the entire world and it's the fourth most visited attraction in France. Alright Aaron, what are you even on the lookout for today? to finish our lovely condo. Well, we don't need anything though. Okay, then we should go home. Well, what are you looking for? I don't know. I don't want to see it. Is that how it works? <laughs> yes, that's how it works. All right. The market is only open Saturday to Monday, and it boasts over 1,700 merchants of a variety of items. Things on offer here range from clothing to home decor to artwork that seems like it could have been plucked out of the Louvre to untrained eyes such as mine. We actually didn't end up buying anything, but it was well worth a visit and a walkabout. After the market, we made our way south to one of the most charming parts of the city, punctuated by the Basilica Sacré-Cœur, Montmartre. While unquestionably popular amongst tourists, Montmartre is such an enjoyable part of Paris as you make your way past shops and buildings that hosted great artists such as Monet, Van Gogh, Picasso, and Renoir. Additionally, Montmartre is featured prominently in films like Gene Kelly's An American in Paris, Moulin Rouge, and the most recent version of Beauty and the Beast. Beware, there are a lot of steps involved in any visit to Montmartre. Steps on steps on steps. But the views of Sacre Cour alone are worth it. After a morning run along the Seine River with sun shining overhead, we marveled at the stained glass of the Saint Chapelle Chapel. Built in 1248, the beauty of this work has impressively stood the test of time. A short walk from Saint Chapelle and the Notre Dame are Paris's famous Bouquinis. The Bouquinis here set up small green boxes along the Seine River that house a particular seller's collection of antique books, newspapers, prints, and the odd painting and touristy keychain. Permits cost a mere 200 euro annually but there is a decades-long waiting list to become a vendor. The practice dates back to the 1600s in Paris, and the stretch which houses over 300,000 books has been declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Alright, I'm sweating profusely because after a 40 minute scooter ride uh, and attempting to park that damn thing at three different spots, I ran back to meet Aaron. We ran between two different boats and finally made it to a river cruise. But uh, despite the sweat, she's looking gorgeous. I tried my best and um, we made it, so here it goes nothing. The boat does one big circle on the river for about three hours and brings you by a number of notable sites along the banks. We opted for the escargot and chicken as well as our fair share of wine for dinner. 
It's a fun way to watch the sun go down on another day in Paris, and we got a kick out of being on the younger side of everyone on the boat. Next up, we headed to the Luxembourg Garden to enjoy an outdoor watercolor painting class. Also known as the Jardin du Sana, the garden was constructed around King Henry IV's widow's palace, but today is owned by the French Senate. We met up with our delightful instructor, Christina, and got a quick masterclass in watercolor techniques, including perspective sketching. As you'll see in a bit, John was a quick study. After some light rain, we settled in and got to painting enjoying both the scenery and the people watching in this beautiful location. I want you to go first. Okay. So you can probably see behind us there's a lovely palace, lots of greenery. You can't see it from this angle, but you can see the Eiffel Tower in the background. So I decided to paint all that. John, have you like to reveal your masterpiece? Yeah, so um, being that we're in, in Paris, I thought it only appropriate to feature uh, the Eiffel Tower. What else? So, I know what you're thinking. It's, it's hard to believe my last art class was in eighth grade. So, um, yeah, here it is. Incorporated a little bit of the orange for uh, Roland Gauss. And, uh, other than that, I don't really know what I was going for. Just wanted to see the Eiffel Tower. So um, should we uh, should we go to the Louvre and see where they want to hang it? It's all right. Aaron's is beautiful. I'm happy to admit that hers is much much better, but uh, they look good side by side. Like us. Like us. The next day, Aaron and I jumped back on the scooter and headed out to the fan zone for the Champions League final, which was taking place in Paris that evening. The match happened to feature my favorite club, Liverpool, against Real Madrid. Tickets were next to impossible to come by, so we settled for the next best thing and joined around 50,000 fellow Liverpool supporters and had a great time singing Beatles songs as well as some Dua Lipa. Some of us had more fun than others, though. Despite the 1-0 Liverpool loss, it was a great day to be a Red. After making museums like the Louvre and the Orsay a big priority last time we were in Paris, Aaron and I really only prioritized one this time around, the Orangerie. Impressionist art is my favorite form, and with Claude Monet's multi-panel water lilies housed here, this stop was a no-brainer. We visited Monet's former home in Giverny our last time in France, which was the inspiration for this beautiful work. Monet offered these eight panels of his water lilies, which were actually 22 paintings in total, to the French government in 1918, and in 1927 they custom-built a museum space to showcase them, though sadly Monet passed away the year before. The paintings are meant to provide the observer with a panoramic view with four of the panels showing the water lilies at sunrise and the other four showing them at dusk. The most remarkable thing about this installation is that it was largely ignored by the public until the 1950s, at which point a renewed interest in Impressionism took Monet's name and work to stratospheric heights where they still remain today. I know my limits when it comes to museums and my attention span, so I left the Orangerie uh, after about an hour. Aaron stayed behind to uh, continue to check out some of the beautiful Impressionist art. But the thing about Paris is you step outside the museum that contains some of the most beautiful artwork in the world, and you're
you're treated to some of the most beautiful sites that men and women have built. You have the Eiffel Tower in the background just outside the Orangerie. Uh, this is Place de la Concorde, which uh, has the famous obelisk right there. And um, as you can see behind me here is the line to get into the Orangerie. So world-class art inside, but you know, if you get a little antsy, you need to step outside into the rain, even in the rain. The city is perhaps more beautiful in the rain. It sparkles and shines like this. Paris is a city unlike any other. Its tales of beauty and romance precede it, and it has taken on an almost mythical quality because of this. I believe that all of this lore is well earned by the French capital. Traversing this city by day and by night is a thrill, and you constantly find yourself at exciting points in its history around every corner, it seems. From strolling along the left bank of the Seine River in the rain, to finding your own piece of temporary Parisian real estate in a sidewalk bistro chair, where you enjoy a purposefully long lunch, a great day can be conjured up from nothing at all in this city. I'm of course not alone in these assessments. There's perhaps never been a city in the world that has made its way into more film, television, and literature than Paris. Hemingway once said, if you're lucky enough to have lived in Paris as a young man, then wherever you go for the rest of your life, it stays with you. For Paris is a movable feast. I tend to feel this way about pretty much everywhere I travel, but it seems particularly stark in regards to Paris. I'm grateful to have experienced the history culture and the charm of this great city yet again, and I hope you will soon too.